Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another webinar tonight, brought to you by New York Gastroenterology Associates. I am Dr. Janie Yang, and I will be moderating the webinar tonight. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing two of my colleagues at NYGA, who will be discussing all things related to celiac disease. First is Dr. Laura Fredo. She is a board-certified gastroenterologist and partner here at NYGA. She is an assistant clinical professor at Mount Sinai Hospital. Her clinical, her clinical interests range from performing screening colonoscopies to managing inflammatory bowel disease, IBS, and of course, celiac disease. She sees patients in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Following her will be Tamara Freuman, she is a registered dietitian here at NYGA. She holds a Master of Science degree in clinical nutrition from NYU and completed her training at Mount Sinai Medical Center. Tamara is the author of the acclaimed books, The Bloated Belly Whisperer from 2018 and Regular, published recently in 2023. And she serves as the medical advisory on the medical advisory board for US News for which she has also written hundreds of articles on digestive health and nutrition over the past decade. And I just heard that she was recently on Kelly and Brian as well. Before I turn the microphone over, a few housekeeping matters. The webinar will be recorded and posted on our NYGA website and a YouTube page where you can find recordings of our previous webinars as well. The presentation will be about 30 to 45 minutes please use the Q&A function to submit questions, which I will help to address during the webinar. And we will try to answer and discuss as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation as time allows. As a reminder, this is not a venue to answer your personal medical questions. If you have specific clinical questions pertaining to your personal health, please make an appointment to see one of our physicians. We aim to conclude this webinar at 9 p.m. today. Without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Fredo and Tamara. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Uh, I appreciate the introduction and thank you all for spending some of your Thursday night or later viewing um, to join us tonight. <clears throat> I apologize, I have a bit of a raspy voice, so I'll be sipping some water to get through this. Okay, so what are we going to talk about tonight? Some of our goals will be to go over what is celiac disease? What are some of the signs and symptoms of it? And why is it actually important to get an actual diagnosis rather than just assuming you have celiac? And what's the process of that diagnosis going to look like? Um, tomorrow we'll talk to us about the basics of a gluten-free diet, but as well as a lot of tips and tricks about following a gluten-free lifestyle. We'll talk about management and follow-up once you do have the diagnosis. And then we'll briefly touch on some of the other things that could be going on if you're having refractory symptoms, ongoing symptoms despite following a gluten-free diet. And then I'll briefly touch on some of the future treatments, some of the devices that exist out there to find out if food has gluten in it or not, and some of the research um, that should be done and is being done. And then we'll, as Dr. Yang mentioned, we'll have some time for questions at the end. So what is celiac disease? Um, and because we have a very cute title, we're going to be talking about some of the myths and the facts that go along with this um, disease. So one of the myths is that it's a true allergy to gluten. So it's not an allergy, a food allergy in the sense you would think of food allergies, such as a peanut allergy, where someone gets short of breath or, you know, gets swelling or rashy or you know, feeling very unwell from that standpoint, it's actually more of an immune system reaction to the gluten protein that's found in wheat, rye, and barley. <clears throat> and it's not just symptoms that occur. You know, you do get symptoms very often with this exposure if you have celiac disease, such as stomach pain or bloating or diarrhea, but it actually causes physical inflammation of the small intestine. And that leads to intestinal damage. And that then leads to um, further systemic symptoms. And an additional thing that happens with celiac disease is your body makes antibodies that you can actually test for that are floating around in the blood. <clears throat> this is not just a digestive disease um, based on symptoms. It's actually a multi-system disease. It affects multiple parts of the body. And we'll talk about how that can manifest. So another myth is that celiac is a rare disease. 
disease. It's very rare to have this. It's actually a very common disease. One in 133 people are diagnosed with celiac. It's very likely that you actually know someone who has celiac, a friend, a classmate, a child, and more people are getting diagnosed with celiac these days than prior due to better understanding of the disease and further knowledge and better testing op options. <clears throat> that being said, only about 50% of people actually know that they have celiac who are walking around with celiac disease. At one point, we thought this was mostly a disease that affected people with demographic backgrounds coming from Western Europe, you know, Irish, English type backgrounds, but it's no longer that sort of disease. We are seeing it much more often in different populations. It's increasingly being found in populations from Northern Africa, the Middle East, India, and China. So anyone with some of the symptoms that we'll discuss, despite where they're coming from, should be checked for this. Um, you need to have certain genes to develop celiac. There are genetic risk factors. Now you may have the genes and, you're, and that doesn't mean you're born with celiac, but you have to have the genes first. And then at some point the, the disease gets basically kind of turned on. <clears throat> it is a permanent condition. It's not something that you grow out of. It's not something that little kids can have and then they don't have it when they get older. Once, Basically, once it manifests, you have it lifelong. And it does drive a pretty large socioeconomic burden due to, you know, doctor's visits, all the testing required, the expenses with actually following a gluten-free diet and a specific diet. So what actually happens when you get exposed to the gluten protein? The autoimmune reaction causes these lovely little villi that are in our in our small intestine, those villi that have that cause a that increase our mucosal um area and allow for absorption of all the nutrients in food, it causes the villi to basically get blunted or even almost go away completely. And therefore you get a loss of surface area and that can cause a chronic malabsorption. And you also lose the lovely enzymes that live in that little villi brush border. Therefore you're not breaking down the food components as well and not absorbing them from that standpoint as well. That then leads to impaired absorption of the important nutrients we need, very specifically certain vitamins, iron, B12, folic acid. And that leads to the systemic symptoms such as weight loss and more symptoms such as osteoporosis, infertility, rashes, skin issues. In addition, you may have an additional secretion of fluid that results in diarrhea, abdominal pain, and bloating. Hmm. So as I mentioned, this is not just digestive symptoms. The most common digestive symptoms we see are, I already mentioned, diarrhea or unformed stools, a sensation of discomfort or pain after you eat, a lot of gas or flatulence, chronic abdominal pain, sometimes vomiting. Sometimes it flips people in the other direction and they become constipated, distended and bloated. Children will see growth retardation. You know, they'll have failure to thrive. Um, it can lead people to an feeling, acting like they're anorexic, a medical anorexia. They don't want to eat because it's uncomfortable for them. And of course, leading to weight loss. But the other systems are affected as well. I've had many patients come to me and they had a long time before they were finally diagnosed with celiac because their symptoms were not digestive. Patients who have had depression or fatigue headaches, peripheral neuropathy. Um, these neurological symptoms can definitely manifest. You can have problems with ulcers in the mouth and problems with your dental enamel. Um, <clears throat> it can cause liver disease, hepatitis, and elevation in your liver enzymes. A very common side effect is iron deficiency anemia. Some people have no digestive symptoms at all and are ju just found to have iron deficiency anemia, and that often warrants a workup for celiac. Some of the um, skeletal issue, issues that can happen, as I mentioned, osteopenia, which is um, not as strong bone structure and osteoporosis where it's very weakened and puts you at increased risk of fractures. Um, you can get arthritis and also joint inflammation, arthralgias. Um, and you can get some lovely skin conditions. Um, look away if uh, skin issues bother you. I'm gonna show a quick picture. So this is a rash that can be seen in people with celiac disease. It's called dermatitis herpetiformis, and it can be a raised red 
papule that can be found often on the elbows or the knees and um, is a sign that we look for for people with celiac. And the good news is when you treat the celiac with a gluten-free diet, the rash does heal. So what are some of the risk factors associated? A family history is a very, very strong risk factor. And then I'll talk about the risks related to people who have celiac and, and your um, potential for getting it. Uh, there are autoimmune conditions that are associated with celiac disease, such as thyroid disease, um, diabetes type one, actually three to 10% of patients with diabetes will also have celiac. Um, there are higher, um, a higher risk with Down syndrome and Turner syndrome. Those aren't autoimmune, but other syndromes. Um, and then there are conditions when you have celiac that can happen more often. These include inflammatory bowel disease, eosinophilic esophagitis, microscopic colitis, liver disease, um, actually types of lymphoma, and certain menstrual disorders, later age of your first period, having an earlier menopause, losing your period, um, and also complications with pregnancies such as miscarriages, spontaneous abortions, low birth weight babies. The lymphoma risk does exist. It's about people with celiac have a three to 12 times higher risk of all types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and a 16 to 40% risk of other intestinal lymphomas. Um, there's a type of a lymphoma that's pretty rare, but pretty aggressive called enteropathy associated T-cell lymphoma. And that often, that usually is only seen in very refractory, very severe, intense cases of celiac. It's extremely rare. <clears throat> so who would I think about, who's the type of patient I would think about testing for celiac disease? So anyone with those classic digestive symptoms, which is pretty much anyone who walks into my office usually is getting, going to get celiac ruled out um, because it can manifest in so many different patterns. Um, but also remembering those on a few of these other symptoms that may not register directly as a digestive issue, such as iron deficiency anemia, or people with early onset osteoporosis, you know, a 30 year old woman with osteoporosis, um, infertility, where the workup has not been fully, you know, you never really found the cause and people with abnormal liver numbers and liver disease. Um, the family history is really important. So if you have a first degree relative with celiac, we highly recommend that you get screened for it. Um, th it's a myth that if you have no symptoms, you do not have celiac. So if you have, we do recommend that if you have a first degree relative that you get screened, we don't recommend blanket screening the entire population because it's not cost effective and, um, it still is rare enough that we don't need to do that, but anyone with a first degree relative should be screened because the risk of having celiac, if you have a sibling with celiac is about 8.9%. If you have celiac, the risk of your child getting it is about 7.9%. And then in the other direction, if you're, you have celiac and your parents' chance of getting it is, or having had it already is about 3%. So the diagnosis is so important because you really want to know if you have celiac, because it will change the management as opposed to just going gluten-free and quote unquote, feeling better. <clears throat> so what we do, if we're wondering if someone has celiac, if they're consuming gluten on a regular basis, is we get some blood work done. This blood work is checking serology, specific antibody against the tissue transglutaminase protein or deaminated gliated peptide. And if that's positive, that is a sign or a screen for celiac. Having that blood test alone, though, is not diagnostic in adults. We um, strongly recommend the additional step of taking an, having an upper endoscopy performed where we take biopsies of the small intestine and look at it under the microscope to see if there's actually damage being done. If the villi are atrophied, if there's inflammation seen in that tissue, and that's how you get the official diagnosis. Occasionally, if the patient has a very high chance of having celiac, you know, multiple family members, classic symptoms, if the blood work is normal, sometimes we'll still do the endoscopy if we have a high likelihood of, you know, catching it. Um, if there, again, if there's a discrepancy, for example, the pathology looked like celiac biopsies, but the blood work was a little unclear. Sometimes we'll do a genetic test. About 
98% of people with celiac have two specific genes, one, two, or both of these genes. And having that genetic test that's positive increases the likelihood that yes, this is in fact celiac. Or on the flip side, if it's normal, if you don't have those specific genes, the likelihood of you having celiac is very low. <clears throat> Now it gets a little tricky. Often patients have kind of done some self-exploration and realize that they feel better on a gluten-free diet already. So often people will come to me describing their symptoms and they're like, oh, I went gluten-free three months ago and I've been a lot better since. If we do that, that's a good place where we can check these genetic markers. If those are positive, then I actually recommend something called the gluten challenge. So we reintroduce gluten back into your diet um, which is usually somewhere at like three slices of bread a day, the equivalent of that um, for as many weeks as you can tolerate it, but usually somewhere in the six to eight week range. And at that point, we'll repeat the serology, the blood test and the <clears throat> endoscopy at that point. And again, it's so important to know if you have celiac or not, because the treatment, which is the gluten-free diet is such a lifestyle change. And you need to know how strict you really need to be with that. Also, we need to know what, how to follow you and what to check you for long-term. So this is slightly different, diagnosing celiac in kids. Um, <clears throat> one myth, like I mentioned earlier, is that kids can outgrow celiac. So if they were gluten diagnosed with celiac as a kid and they're tolerating gluten as an adult, they've grown out of it, it's highly unlikely. They probably need to see an adult gastro and reconfirm they have celiac disease. So children in general in the United States undergo the same evaluation when we're, we're thinking about these symptoms. They get serology checked, they get the endoscopy done. But there are new guidelines to uh, you know try to avoid putting little kids through these pr procedures if their blood level is 10 times the higher upper limit of normal. So very significantly elevated you follow it up with a second blood test for an endomesial antibody. And if that is positive, you probably can very likely say that this is celiac without putting them through an endoscopy. Right now, there's not enough data to correlate that to adult diagnosis, but it's starting to gain a little traction in Europe. Um, but this is uh, something where tons of research is being performed. So the treatment of celiac, as I have alluded to, basically the only treatment that we have is a gluten-free diet. What does that mean? It means you avoid wheat, barley, rye, and foods or products that are cross-contaminated with this gluten. The <clears throat> diet improves symptoms, it improves your quality of life, and reduces these long-term complications that I discussed. The goals are that you're feeling better, and we continue to follow that you're following, follow you and follow that you're following the gluten-free diet. Um, they say that the gluten, the diarrhea symptoms and a lot of the digestive symptoms will improve in 80% of patients within 60 days if they're being strict about their gluten-free diet. <clears throat> and as we monitor you, we, we do some preventative care. We actively make sure new, new things haven't propped up, um, other coexistent autoimmune diseases, and make sure we're um, preventing any of the long-term complications, such as malignancy, osteoporosis, liver disease, infertility. So I am going to now turn it over to Tamara to talk more specifically about what this actually looks like in practice. And then I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fredo. And thanks everyone for being here. I recognize a bunch of my patients. So I hope this isn't too repetitive for you all. There will be a test later. Um, so what does a strict gluten-free diet look like in practice? I should know. I follow one because I also have celiac disease. So, you know, on the surface of it, as Dr. Fredo said, we're avoiding any food that has wheat, barley, rye, or any ingredients derived from them. But a lot of us don't necessarily have intimate familiarity with every grain and every ingredient in the world. And so I like to get really specific. There are relatives of wheat that don't have the word wheat in their name. Things like farro, spelt, kamut, triticale, um, and then different types of wheat, semolina, bulgur, um, and then little things that look like rice, but are actually pasta like orzo and couscous. Those are actually wheat. Um, things that are derived from barley, which is malt flavoring, which is in a ton of products. Uh, it's in a lot of candies um, and in like chips and a lot of savory snack foods. Soy sauce is made from soybeans, but regular soy sauce also has wheat um, and beer and all types of um, 
beer type products made from wheat or barley or malt liquor are all verboten on the gluten-free diet. Um, it's super important to read labels even when foods say gluten-free. One of the first most common questions I get from patients who come to me with a new diagnosis of celiac disease is, like, if I just eat everything, like, only eat things that are labeled gluten-free, am I safe? And the answer is unfortunately not. And I'm going to show you a bunch of slides that really explain why we unfortunately cannot just use a gluten-free claim on a label or on a restaurant menu as shorthand for it's safe, I can eat it. You really need to learn how to read labels. Um, even though oats are not a gluten-containing grain, um, and technically they are gluten-free, and we'll talk about oats in a, a slide or two, and I'll explain about this. Um, most oat products that are not certified gluten-free are very likely to have enough cross contact with wheat or barley that they will contain um, unsafe levels of gluten. So you also even have to be careful with oat products, um, which doesn't mean no oats, it just means certain oats. Um, and restaurant eating is something that we really have to be careful at. I think most people who are really well-practiced and who have mastered the gluten-free diet, myself included, still every so often we'll get into trouble at a restaurant when we make an assumption or we are misinformed by a server. You have to be careful for shared fryers. Um, pizzerias, Italian restaurants are a really big problem for those of us with celiac disease. Nowadays, so many restaurants have gluten-free pizzas and gluten-free pastas, but how many of those gluten-free pastas are being prepared in separate water dedicated only to gluten-free pasta versus are being cooked in that same starchy water that all of the regular pasta is being cooked in. How many of our gluten-free pizzerias are just taking a gluten-free pizza crust out of the freezer, tossing it on the same floured surface that the pizza dough was just rolled out on for regular pizzas, throwing it in the oven without any foil under it, or dragging a roller through your gluten-free pizza that just got dragged through three other regular pizzas. And so, you know, all of these things can make a quote-unquote gluten-free restaurant item no longer safe for someone with celiac disease. There's a great um, bakery cafe chain in Manhattan that has this gorgeous looking gluten-free bread. And it is sort of on these baker racks surrounded by all these other breads, like crummy breads. And they're being cut on the same exact, you know, crummy surface. And so this bread looks incredible, but I've never actually gotten a sandwich on it. Um, and we also have to be careful about medications and supplements. I cannot tell you how many patients have come to me um, with well-controlled celiac disease for years and years and years, all of a sudden becoming symptomatic, and the doctor rechecks their antibodies and they're positive. And the only different thing in their life was that they recently started with sort of more alternative medicine, functional medicine stuff, and started taking like dozens of dietary supplements. And the patient assures me every single one of the supplements is labeled gluten-free. And you know what? One of them was lying because once we discontinue the supplements, the antibodies go negative. And so dietary supplements are also a really common source of unlabeled gluten. Uh, next slide, Laura, please. Um, so as Dr. Fredo said, there's only one cure for celiac disease, not a cure, but treatment, I should say. We don't cure celiac disease. Um, and there's nothing that you can do to make gluten safe for you. Um, there's a lot of enzymes that are being sold online and in drugstores that claim to be a glutenase that somehow makes gluten tolerable or safe or decontaminates gluten somehow. It is not true. It is absolute nonsense. They are not um, they are not preventive. In other words, if you have celiac disease and you take these enzymes, it's not safe. And if you accidentally get glutened, taking these enzymes will do nothing for you. Um, taking binders uh, like a, a charcoal pill, which, you know, has this reputation as sort of a detox supplement is also not going to do a thing for you because the celiac reaction is an immune reaction. It's like, you know, these trace amounts of gluten um, just activate and turn on the immune system response. And so, you know, even if that gluten particle was sort of, you know, um, sequestered in like a chunk of charcoal, it doesn't matter. Once an immune cell catches wind of it, the cascade, the inflammatory cascade just kind of turns on and, you know, and persists long after that little drop of gluten has been pooped out of your system. And so, um, and so that's something to be aware of. The gadgets and sensors that are being marketed to kind of help you test your restaurant food to make sure that it's safe to eat um, are really not well validated. And frankly, I don't think that they're particularly reliable. Um, the problem is that food, the food matrix is really variable and you can take a sample from one forkful and that might be fine. And then three forkfuls later it might not be fine. Um, and you're not going to exactly feed the entire dish of food into one of these sensors. 
Um, and when a lot of these products have been audited by third parties, there are really, really high rates of false negatives. And for very specific foods and dairy in particular with the NEMA sensor, there's really high rates of false positives. So I just, I don't think that these devices are validated enough and are sensitive enough to be ready for prime time. And so until we have better technology for this type of stuff, we with we people with celiac disease really need to use our own but vigilance and and thoughtfulness and um and analytical skills when we're eating out to navigate the food scenes that we can eat out safely and deliciously. Next slide. Okay. So when people say if it says gluten free, can I eat it? No, not necessarily. Um, look at the picture in the middle of this slide. This is a barbecue sauce, and you can see big bold font gluten free. And then if you actually read the ingredient list, which is the same ingredient list from this product, you see three lines up from the bottom, mesquite smoke powder, malt barley flour. Hi, <laughs> malt barley flour is definitely not gluten-free. So, you know, you can say gluten-free if you're a product manufacturer. Nobody is auditing this. The FDA is not checking every product label that goes on shelves. This is all voluntary claims for manufacturers. And there's just really no surveillance or monitoring being done by the FDA. Anybody can say gluten-free. And until something like this is caught by um, a consumer and then, you know, they write to the FDA and they register a complaint and then the FDA investigates it, you know, that's really how things get um, enforced, which is a really slow and arduous process. And in that, you know, and throughout that time, how many people with celiac disease have eaten this product and gotten exposed to gluten? my patients, you need to learn how to read a label. You need to learn all the words that you're looking for on a label and not just trust a gluten-free claim, um, but really make sure. Um, the other thing to be aware of is uh, there are a couple of certifications whose like the certifying bodies I think are reliable. And so those there's two of them on the bottom left, the certified gluten-free um, circle and then the certified NSF. I do think that if you see those in a product, um, I would trust those. Um, but be aware that there's a lot of lookalike uh, types of logos that say gluten-free, which have no kind of accredited, rep like reputable body behind them. And so just because something has like a black circle that says GF, you know, that might just be somebody in that product's design department that just wrote that. That's not necessarily any kind of certification. And so there's very few certifications that I think that you could use as shorthand for something being safe. So just be really aware of that. Next slide. Okay, alcohol. Um, so a lot of my patients um, are probably surprisingly more concerned about spirits and distilled alcohol than they need to be. I think in the celiac community, Tito's Vodka, which I shout out, hey, Tito's, send me some samples. Um, it's great. It's fine. It's wonderful. It's, I think, made from potatoes. And so everyone, all, everyone with celiac disease is like, I only drink Tito's. In reality, vodka and other distilled spirits, even if they come from wheat, um, are still going to probably be gluten-free, almost certainly, because the distillation process removes all protein and protein fragments and our available testing, I'll talk about the lab testing in a minute, um, is also able to be used in distilled spirits to verify the gluten-free status. And so something that is certified gluten-free um, is that is reliable in a distilled spirit. So, you know, different types of like, you know, whiskeys and vodkas, even if there is some wheat somewhere in the origin are going to be safe for people with celiac disease. You really don't need to be hyper vigilant about what brand of spirits you have. The main issue you have to be careful with are malt beverages and beer. These are not distilled spirits. These are fermented and the fermentation process, um, the products of these fermented fermentation processes are not, um, the tests that we have are not validated for these products. So we can't accurately test for the presence of gluten in some of these products like beer, especially. And so if there is a beer that has, you know, wheat or barley um, as one of its originating ingredients, even if the manufacturer says that, you know, we've crafted them to remove gluten or we reduce the gluten or whatever, and we've tested it, those tests aren't necessarily reliable. So I would not consider um, a beer crafted to remove gluten necessarily safe with our currently available testing. So I tell my patients, if you are a beer drinker, really stick to the actual gluten-free beers that are made with gluten-free grains, rice, millet, um, and, you know, exotic gluten-free grains are a safer way to get your beer if you are a beer drinker. 
Uh, and wines are always fine. There's no uh, gluten in wine, so you never have to worry about that. Next slide. Okay, let's talk about oats. So oats are tricky because the FDA allows any oat containing product to carry a gluten-free claim. That is legal. And that's because oats are a gluten-free grain. Uh, so any product that is formulated with oats and no wheat, no barley, no rye can say that their product is gluten-free. The problem is that conventionally grown and processed oats are widely cross-contaminated with gluten. And this is an older study, but I think it really illustrates the point. This study is almost 20 years old at this point, um, where they took three different brands of just conventional oats, and they took like just product samples off the shelf from four completely different batches. And then they subjected them to ELISA testing. I'll explain in a minute what ELISA testing is. It's actually helpful for us to know. Um, and they kind of ground them up and they tested them to see how much gluten was in them. And they found that 75% of these conventional oat products contained enough gluten that it would not be considered gluten-free. Um, and so while you can see in the chart, some of the products in these brands were gluten-free, but some of them were not. So if you're, say, buying like conventional Quaker oats, you're kind of rolling the dice. Like you might buy one container one day and it's totally fine and you're great. And then when you run out and you go to buy a new package in the supermarket, the next container you get could have like really wildly high. So it's not even like you can trust a particular brand because within the brands there can be a lot of variation. Um, so, you know, that really speaks to the importance of buying only certified gluten-free oats. On the next slide in a moment, I'll explain, you know, sort of how to look for that. But I want to just take a quick moment and explain what ELISA testing is, because I think it's interesting and important, and you'll see it a lot on gluten-free products. ELISA testing is a form of laboratory testing. It's not specific for gluten. They can use ELISA testing to check for, like, HIV antibodies um, or all sorts of other things. But really what this testing does is it uses antibodies to kind of seek out a specific antigen in a product. And so, for example, if we're looking for gluten, we look for a fragment of the gluten protein called gliadin. And, we, and the way that we do that is we introduce an antibody to gliadin into a sample of the food product. And if there is gliadin in that product, the antibody is going to bind with it as antibodies do. Now, in this form of lab testing, when the antibody finds its antigen, that binding creates a color. And the more of these reactions that are happening in the food sample, the darker the color will be. And so the way that these tests work is that the labs can kind of put the antibody into a food sample. And based on the color that the sample turns, they can see how much gliadin is in the product and whether it meets the FDA standards of less than 20 part per million to be called gluten-free. It's a really, really cool technology. And that's so when you see on a gluten-free label that this product was ELISA tested uh, and confirmed to have less than 20 parts per million of gluten, that's how they test for it. Kind of cool. Um, next slide, Laura. Um, so if you enjoy granola and, you know, uh, oat products as much as I do, you need to read ingredient labels. So I have two examples here of a granola. We have the kind, healthy greens, and you see I circled in red. It says gluten-free right on the front. But when you turn it over and read the ingredient list, the first ingredient is oats. It's not gluten-free oats. It's not certified gluten-free oats. It's just regular oats. I would not consider this product safe for someone with celiac disease. Now, next, we have another brand. This is Purely Elizabeth. It also says gluten-free on front. It's not certified. It just has a gluten-free claim. But then when you look it over and read the ingredient list, you see on the other side, it says organic certified gluten-free oats. That's what you are looking for when you have celiac disease and you want an oat product. Be super careful with oat milk. I have a lot of patients who are now, you know, who are dairy-free and gluten-free. And then, you know, when oat milk came out, everybody switched to oat milk from almond milk. And all of a sudden everyone's now drinking regular oat milk. There's only one brand of uh, oat milk that uses certified gluten-free oats to my knowledge, and it's Oatly. Everything else is not for you if you have celiac disease. Gluten-free Oreos use regular oat flour. I would not consider those safe. Cheerios, they say gluten-free on the front, but they're not using certified gluten-free oats. I would not consider those safe. So you can have oats on a gluten-free diet, but if there's an oat-containing product that says gluten-free, I encourage you to turn it over and read the label and understand whether the oats are safe for you to eat or not. Some of them will just not be. Okay, next slide. I wanna talk about French fries. It's a really important question. I love French fries. It's a very important question to my heart. Um, can we eat French fries at restaurants? Okay, 
So my, my dietitian colleagues did a study uh, a couple years ago at this point where they wanted to really understand how widespread is gluten contamination on restaurant French fries. So they went to 10 different restaurants in the Midwest, all of which say that their French fries themselves are gluten free. In other words, the potato fry itself has no gluten in it. Um, and these are products that are these are fries that are sharing a fryer with other foods on the restaurant menu. And the, the researchers went and got one sample one week apart from the same 10 restaurants so that they could account for maybe the oil got changed. Like the first day they did the study, maybe the oil was just changed that morning. And so, bam, it was super clean. So they wanted to hit the same restaurants at two different times to just, you know, look for that variability. So they get these 20 French fry samples. They all undergo illicit testing, which you now know what that is. And what they found is that they did find gluten quantifiable in 45% of the orders, um, which was about from 60% of the restaurants. Um, but not all of them was enough gluten that meets the sort of threshold of 20 parts per million. About 25% of them did. So based on this one study, our best estimate is that if you're eating share French fries at a restaurant that's sharing fryers with other like other battered foods, you know, there's a one in four chance that you are going to have a gluten exposure by eating those French fries. It's a pretty high number for someone with celiac disease. Um, my advice is not never, ever eat a French fry out. My advice is if you are eating a French fry or you wanted to eat fries at a restaurant, you need to look at the rest of the menu and see what else is fried on that menu. What else is going in that fryer? Not all fryers are shared fryers. There's some like you know, continental restaurants or, you know, or burger places that don't have, you know, battered chicken fingers or, you know, bread crummy shrimp or whatever. And if they're literally only making French fries and if the kitchen can assure you that the French fries themselves don't have any flour on them, go for it. Um, there are some chainlets in New York City that use dedicated fryers for um, the for the French fries, like Bear Burger. And so if you want a good burger and fries, go to Bear Burger and you can have a safe French fry there. But I would say for me as a celiac, I would say most of the time I'm not eating restaurant French fries. And once in a while, depending on what else is on the menu, I go for it. I hope that's helpful. Next slide. Um, supplements. So supplements are a really devilish place where gluten hides, even and especially supplements that are labeled gluten-free. Supplements are basically unregulated in the U.S. There is no enforcement. There's no regulation. Unlike over-the-counter medication where companies actually have to prove and demonstrate to the FDA that what they say is in the product is actually in the product, supplements are under no such legal requirements. Um, and so it is really, really common for supplements to have undeclared allergens um, and also, frankly, to not have what they say they have, which is another issue with quality control. Um, we have to also be aware that a lot of supplements um, that you find on the shelves are not even manufactured here in the U.S. And so if, like it's a company, like a really big, reputable company, you know, like a nature meat or a twin lab, like they own their own factories, their own manufacturing process. They they hire quality assurance departments and auditors who are like looking over good manufacturing practices. But a lot of these small, trendy supplement companies are completely outsourcing and contract manufacturing their supplements um, in factories abroad. A lot of them are in Asia, where quality control is typically not as strong. And they are not necessarily testing their products when they come back into the U.S. to make sure that they don't have undeclared allergens. And so what can happen is if you have celiac disease and you're taking a ton, a ton of supplements, there's a really decent chance that you could be having gluten exposure unless you're really, really cautious about what brands you buy. And I I don't mean what brands say that they're gluten-free. I mean, what brands and what type of products we know um, to be reputable. This was a really interesting study from 2015 that Columbia University did, um, which looked at probiotics. They looked at top selling probiotics in the U.S. Um, and found that more than half of them, I think it was 55 percent of them, were contaminated with gluten, even though they said gluten-free. So these are probiotics. I mean, you guys, we're GI, we're a GI patient community. A lot of us take probiotics or a lot of you take probiotics. And I think it's really harrowing to think um, that, you know, over half of the top selling probiotics in 2015 um, contain gluten, despite being labeled gluten free. So probiotics is, I mean, I think it's risky. And I don't know really if the industry has cleaned itself up yet. Next slide. Um, so how do we select medications and supplements safely? Supplements is really, really hard. Um, Gluten-free claims, unfortunately, are not super reliable. 
what I say is, you know, and when you're my patient, you'll probably have gotten a handout from me where I kind of go through some of the brands that are, you know, have a greater reputation, but there are companies like Twin Lab and Solgar um, and Nature Mead that are large American manufactured products um, that I think are reputable. There are two certifications you can look for, the USP um, and the NSF certified gluten-free, which I think are trustworthy. Um, and if those products say gluten-free, I would trust that they are. And also certain forms of supplements are less likely to be contaminated with gluten, like a gel cap, like a, like a, you know, like a gel cap. <laughs> I don't know what else to call them, like the gooey soft gels. Um, because they're not like a powder and they don't have like a um, like the type of coating that a tablet or a capsule has, like the gel caps typically aren't ever going to have gluten in them. That's just like not a, a common ingredient used for that type of product. Gummy products that are made in the U.S. are almost never going to have gluten in them. European ones can sometimes use a glucose syrup made from wheat, but American made gummies should be one of the pretty safe forms. It's really pills, tablets um, that you want to be a little more careful about. Um, and, and really be mindful of what brands you buy. And I'm just, I really encourage people to be a minimalist with your supplements. Don't take a bunch of random stuff that you just read about online, like really keep the supplements to a minimum of what's really important for you and what's kind of more medically necessary or vitamin D and calcium for your bones, or if you need a fish oil for your triglycerides, um, but really not to go overboard with supplements when you have celiac disease. Um, new legislation has been introduced this past year um, that would require gluten to be identified in actual medication, both over the counter as well as prescription. It's called the ADENA Act. It's not yet law, but when it becomes law, which hopefully will be soon, um, it will be a lot easier um, because it will require products to have a label and identification of gluten um, so that you don't have to like be looking online and asking a pharmacist about inactive ingredients. For now, if you take prescription medications. I always encourage my newly diagnosed patients with celiac disease to just, if you take a bunch of medications, just like go to your pharmacist during a, a downtime when they're not super busy and ask them if they would just look through the list of inactives um, in their database and make sure that all the medications you take are don't contain starch or wheat starch or modified food starch or other forms of wheat or gluten. If you ever get switched from a name brand to a generic, you'll have to do this again. Um, so just be mindful if you take medications that this is something you need to have on your radar screen. So what's the deal with this? A patient brought this to me the other day and I gave her the complete wrong advice. And if she's here tonight, I'm really sorry. And this is my, <laughs> I made a slide just for you. Uh, we found this product, gluten-free bread flour. And then we looked at the back and the number one ingredient was gluten-free wheat starch. And we were both like, what? That's crazy. How could that be? That's not for you. But I did look into it and it turns out I was wrong. There are forms of wheat starch that um, is processed to remove gluten and they do such a good job that when you ELISA test it, it comes out as less than 20 parts per million of gluten. And if a product, if a brand is using wheat flour and they state on their label that they do ELISA testing to verify that it is less than 20 parts per million, it's safe. So this is a good example of a product, the King Arthur product, I would trust. An example of a product that I wouldn't trust is, for example, Benefiber, which is a supplemental fiber that a lot of our GI patients use. They also use uh, wheat dextrin, but they don't say anything on the label about Elisa testing their wheat dextrin to confirm that it's gluten-free. So I really kind of just have my celiac patients steer clear of the Benefiber, and we use different types of fiber. So, you know, if there's a statement around Elisa testing for gluten-free wheat starch, you can do it. And I think a lot of the Italian products, like the uh, Italian pizza crust and Italian pastas are using the gluten-free wheat starch, and that's probably why they taste so good. And I think that's it. Thank you so much. It's such hands-on useful information. And um, <clears throat> we have three amazing um, dietitians in our practice who are ready to help you with any of your questions and guide you along your gluten-free journey if the if it has to come to that. Um, <clears throat> I really encourage my patients when they're diagnosed to work with our dietitians because they're that's this is their specialty. The diet is not arguably my specialty at all. They went to school for this. I went for the digestive diseases and they went for the diet. So <clears throat> We work together and we're so lucky to have them as an amazing resource. Um, so when we diagnose you, the first thing I'm going to say is I'm going to put you in touch with our dietitians. You guys are going to work closely and really um, dive into the gluten-free lifestyle. I do recommend very close follow-up once you've been diagnosed because we want to make sure all your efforts at the gluten-free diet are working. 
Um, <clears throat> once you've kind of been on a roll and you're doing well, at least once a year, you should probably meet with a dietitian. And at that time, what we're doing, I mean, with a gastroenterologist and what that time we're doing um, some blood work, we want to really see that those antibodies that you had when you were consuming gluten have normalized. We want to make sure you're not anemic. We want to make sure your vitamin levels are adequate. And if you need any appropriate medically necessary supplements, we will help you pick the right ones. <clears throat> we'll check your liver enzymes. Um, often patients will, I will recommend a DEXA bone scan to see what the status is of your bones, especially if you've had symptoms for a long time. Um, patients with uh, celiac disease have a significantly increased risk of pneumococcal infection. So things like pneumonia or a sepsis from the bacteria, pneumococcus pneumonia. Um, <clears throat> so we actually recommend no matter your age for you to get a pneumonia vaccine. So at any of my newly diagnosed celiac patients will hear my spiel on preventative care. And I highly recommend the pneumonia vaccine. This is usually something saved for older adults, 65 and older. But any age diagnosis, we would give you the pneumonia vaccine. Um, then as you're following the gluten-free diet, yes, we're following the serology and we're hoping that it completely goes back into the normal range. But that being said, there is a poor correlation with the serology normalizing and the actual healing of the villi. So guidelines are recommending that we actually um, repeat the endoscopy at an interval around one to two years to make sure the villi have healed. Um, <clears throat> it's a treat to target style um, management, which we do for other diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and we really want to reassure ourselves that, you know, you're, you're doing the best you can to prevent long-term um, complications. Um, if you have, if you're not healing the villi, that does increase your risk of um, osteoporosis, increased risk of hip fracture, and then this phenomenon called refractory celiac disease, which can increase your risk of some of these cancers that I had mentioned. So some people go gluten-free, they're doing great, their serology is better, their dietitian is very happy with how they're maintaining their gluten-free lifestyle, but they're still having some ongoing symptoms, maybe occasional diarrhea, maybe occasional pain. That's why it's still so important to continue to follow with your team. Some of these ongoing symptoms could just be that you're inadvertently getting exposed to gluten, but it could be other things. Unfortunately, you could have celiac and IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. <clears throat> there could be additional food intolerances, such as other disaccharides that may bother you, such as lactose or fructans. There could, there, as I mentioned before, there's an increased risk of other conditions that can also cause diarrhea. So microscopic colitis is also a um, condition that can cause very similar digestive symptoms and runs more frequently with people with celiac. IBD, inflammatory bowel disease can occur. Pancreatic insufficiency where you're not making the proper digestive enzymes. A condition called SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, very common in celiac patients because their villi is not, their villi are not intact and healthy. The microbiome is off and then it can lead to overgrowth of the bacteria in the small intestine. Eosinophilic enteritis is another condition that can cause similar symptoms. <clears throat> and then, like I mentioned, we really want to make sure it's not refractory celiac disease. Um, this is, we classify someone as refractory celiac when they have none of these other conditions and ongoing symptoms, despite being gluten-free for 12 months or so on their biopsies, they are continuing to show persistent villi, villi atrophy. Those villi are not happy. Luckily, it's very rare. Less than 1% of patients with celiac disease will get refractory celiac. And there are two types. One is usually just because you're getting inadvertent gluten exposure and usually <clears throat> eliminating all processed foods, supplements, will allow for a resolution of the inflammation. But there is a second type, refractory celiac type two, <clears throat> excuse me, and then that is characterized by more of this immune process. There are um, inappropriate T cells that are hanging out in this uh, in the, um, small bowel lumen and it has a much poorer prognosis. And those are the patients where we worry about the risk of this um, enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma. So again, not for you guys to really stress about because it still is very rare. We see it much more at big academic referral centers, but 
just another reason to continue to be in touch with your doctor if you're not feeling great. So right now, as we mentioned, the only treatment for celiac is the gluten-free diet. But the gluten-free lifestyle is hard. Um, medication would be lovely and so needed. Um, they There's a study from, it was a kind of older study, but they asked patients with celiac how satisfied they are um, following a gluten-free diet. And not many of them said they feel like their lifestyle is great or good. Um, so it shows that, you know, people are wanting something else than just following this gluten-free diet. Um, people with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, colitis, you know, there may be a period where they cannot eat a normal lifestyle to manage, eat normally to manage their symptoms. But eventually, once they're on medicine and their inflammation has calmed down, a lot of them do get back to being able to eat a more regular diet. And poor celiac patients don't have that option right now. They just have to, you know, commit to the gluten-free lifestyle. There is also a phenomenon where, you know, people were diagnosed with milder symptoms or maybe no digestive symptoms. They had iron deficiency anemia, we found celiac, and then they went gluten-free. And then all of a sudden they start to realize when they are exposed to gluten after it being out of their system for a while, they're so sick. They instantly get digestive symptoms when they probably didn't have them as bad before. So there's definitely a need for medication. Um, another study just surveying, you know, what patients would be interested in. 55% of patients with celiac are very interested in considering a medication. <clears throat> so a lot of the research going on in the medication field right now, there, there's many, many options that are being looked at. And I just think they're a little bit interesting. None of them are out yet, but um, they're trying to attack it from different directions. So one one way they look at it is trying to neutralize or break down the actual gluten protein into less toxic compounds. So that would probably be almost a compound that works directly on the food before you consume it. Nothing's panned out with that yet. Or they're constantly looking into enzymes to be taken with food to break down the gluten proteins. The, these glutenase products that Tamara mentioned haven't, haven't come to fruition yet and really haven't done much for it yet. Um, they are doing a lot of research on different types of probiotics to stimulate a uh, response and almost suppress the immune system response to the gluten. We're looking at, they're looking at ways to change the permeability across the digestive tract, um, see if they can make those tight junctions a little less um, open and less gluten potentially crossing over. Um, and then on the immune side of things, they're trying to look at ways to suppress the immune system's response to the gluten so that you don't have such an inflammatory cascade that happens. They work on this, working on some of the interleukin cells in the, in the border of the intestines and also just in the innate T cell response, almost like giving a vaccine, a vaccine that desensitizes your immune system. So when you do get exposed to gluten, everything doesn't ramp up as intensely. So there's a lot out there. I think we're very hopeful that things will develop and come, but it's a long process. <clears throat> so one other big topic that we are just touching on tonight is, okay, I've cut out the gluten. You've checked me for celiac. I don't have celiac, but I feel so much better on a gluten-free diet. Why is that? So this is tomorrow's slide, but I'm just going to wrap it up for her. So it's probably because there's some other component of wheat that is bothering you. So in our lovely FODMAPs that we talk about a lot when we're trying to figure out what foods are triggering digestive distress are the fructans. This is a poorly absorbed carbohydrate. These are very, very often responsible for a majority of reactions that people have when they consume um, foods with gluten, but it's not a celiac reaction, people with IBS who are gluten sensitive. Um, it's probably that you're actually reacting to the fructans. Um, another thing that might, might be why you feel better is you basically, by going gluten-free, you've cut out a ton of processed food that have a lot of other hard to process ingredients such as inulin or sugar alcohols or these artificial sweeteners. And then there are some people who actually have a nickel allergy. And when they eat um, 
foods that are whole wheat with a lot of wheat bran, they have high nickel content. And it's actually cutting out the nickel that has made them feel better, not necessarily the wheat protein. Another reason you might feel better is that you're no longer depending on, you know, your breads, your sandwiches, your pasta, your pastries, and you're eating a more well-rounded diet with more whole foods like fruits and veggies and nuts it will just help with your digestive tract, better regulate your function and keep your blood sugar levels more steady and thus giving you some more energy. <clears throat> so just quickly wrapping up some of the myths and facts that we hope to have cleared up for you tonight. Um, again, the myth that you feel better on a gluten-free diet alone definitely indicates that you have celiac disease is not enough. It may, as I just mentioned, indicate intolerance to other components of wheat. Um, another myth that you had a blood test and that's, or genetic test, and that was positive and that's enough to confirm that you have celiac. At this point for adults, we really want to hone in and know if you have celiac on the intestinal biopsies, and then even check down the road once you've been gluten-free that it is healed. Um, <clears throat> another myth, myth is that gluten-free diet will cure the celiac and completely fix it. Again, it's not a cure, it's a management and it's a treatment, but there are some refractory cases or people who have coexisting symptoms. So you go gluten-free and you're not feeling better. Come on back. We'll figure out what could still be driving some of your symptoms. And as Tamara very expertly taught us all tonight, anything with gluten-free is not safe. You really need to read your labels, um, educate yourself on how to properly understand certified organic gluten-free and consider the cross-contamination when dining out and make sure you're seeking out these certified gluten-free products. Okay, so I think we're gonna open it up to some questions now. All right, that was amazing. Oh my God, I learned so much. Nothing's better than getting information from someone who actually has this condition and firsthand, really firsthand information. So this was great. Um, so we only have a few minutes left to answer some questions. One question that I um, saw in the Q&A that I found interesting is regarding the age of diagnosis. So I think Dr. Fedor mentioned before that some kids can have celiac disease um, like very early on. And then what about later on in their life? Is, there, is it possible for someone to be diagnosed with this condition much later? Well, I, I treat patients 16 and up. So I am constantly diagnosing celiac disease and the majority of my patients are, you know, adults. Um, <clears throat> it is very, very common for people to go years and years without a diagnosis um, before they finally, you know, seek out care and get diagnosed. So it's very common to be an adult and get diagnosed. Also, you could have the genetic potential <clears throat> and it has not turned on in your immune system yet. You could have the genes, but not have celiac and then you could potentially develop it later in life. All right, and then another question I saw is regarding, so I, I guess some some people are being diagnosed with celiac disease and SIBO, so small intestinal bacteria overgrowth as well. Um, are there any other GI related conditions that celiac disease patients are more um, likely to develop? Yes, yeah, so we did touch on this. There is definitely a correlation with microscopic colitis. So this is a, not a progressive or damaging disease such as like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, but it's a um, layer of inflammation in the digest in the colon that prevents water absorption basically, and it can cause a constant chronic watery diarrhea. So that's a very common comorbidity that happens. You know, people go gluten free and they're not getting better at all. So then sometimes we go on a hunt and do a colonoscopy to check for something such as microscopic colitis. That's right, and then I believe eosinophilic esophagitis can sometimes be related mm -hmm. to celiac disease as well because they're both a kind of autoimmune conditions involving the yeah e eosinophilic inflammation pretty much anywhere stomach and intestines as well yeah that's right all right so it's nine o'clock i'm gonna stay on for a little bit to answer some of the questions that were not answered but otherwise thank you again for joining us i'm gonna turn off the video and the, um, the camera so that i'm gonna try to focus on answering some of the questions thank you again guys and have a good night Thanks so. all.